1988 was when I started working in those archives. Uh, there was still communism. There was still the Soviet yeah. Union. Yeah. Ukraine was not independent. In fact, in 1988, uh, really Perestroika, Perebudova had barely hit Ukraine. It wasn't until 89 that you really felt the change in Ukraine. Um, so, since then, one of the huge things is that the archives have been opened. The Soviet archives, Polish archives, all kinds of archives are now open on this topic. And one of the first things that the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum did, once the archives were open and before they became as crazily regulated as they are right now on these issues, they microfilmed uh, file after file uh, of materials relating to the Holocaust. They started to research uh, Oun and Upa in Ukraine with, you know, with their local archives and better archives than, uh, you know, very wide ranging uh, 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 access to the archives that were hidden by the formerly the KGB and now by the SBU. Uh, so, um, uh, in, and in Ukraine, there were people who, were, who, who started writing very serious and interesting monographs on Oun Upa, which helped to give us the, 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 the understanding of the, of the context. Plus, in the diaspora, lots of formal, former Oun members uh, began to write more forthcoming memoirs. Because before the collapse of communism, people were a little afraid to write, and I document this well in the book, I think. It's in one footnote, but it's well documented. Uh, a lot of activists and veterans of Oun and Upa did not want to write in much detail because they feared that by giving details, they might expose their relatives or their comrades uh, in Ukraine to arrest and to persecution and harassment. So. Uh, when that was lifted, all of a sudden, veterans became loquacious. That really helped me. Uh, and in Ukraine, the, the mem members who were amnestied back in the 50s and were not still in jail and were, were, uh, were out, they also began to write, and not only to write, but to cooperate with scholars. So uh, the eminent historian in Lviv, Yaroslav Dashkevich, worked with Vasil Kuk, who was the last head of, uh, of UPA, or last head of Oun, and uh, he helped uh, Dashkevich make sense of the period around June 30th of 1941 when they, when they uh, de declared statehood. You're in Toronto right now, and if you go to the university, you have the Peter J. Potichny collection. That is also microfilms of uh, documents from the Soviet archives, and they uh, that were opened in the 1990s, and they also in Litopis Upa, which was um, later they began to have a kind of a Toronto, a Toronto K of Lviv uh, access where they worked together. They published those also in the volumes of Litopis Upa. So yeah, there 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 were, but I have to say, not to the same extent as the Holocaust. Let us, let us remember that, uh, that the studies and centers for the study of the Holocaust are large international organizations. Uh, for me, there are, there, are, there are some big ones. You know, there's the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. There's Yad Vashem in uh, Jerusalem. There's the Wiener Library in London. But there's also a plethora of smaller Holocaust museums and libraries. Uh, even at my university, the University of Alberta, we have a, a special two special collections of Holocaust literature. Many universities have chairs of Holocaust studies. You have uh, in, in uh, Toronto, at the University of Toronto, of Doris Bergen and Michael Maris working. You know, so. You compare that to Ukrainian studies, and Ukrainian studies, um, 
Um, maybe they, maybe they, the, the original visionary period was past. Let me put it that 